Welcome, everybody, to the Friday panel series of the International Writing Program's Fall Residency. For those of you who are new to our programming, we've given our writers a topic to consider and present to you today. Copies of these pracy will be available next week on our website at iwp.uiowa.edu, where you can also find biographies and writing samples from our writers and a schedule of our upcoming events. You can also find this information by scanning the QR code on the bookmarks available at the back of the room. And now for today's panel, Writing the Not Self, on appropriation and other literary excursions into otherness. In one way or another, writers can't avoid creating some characters different from themselves when such a character is depicted as, quote, belonging, close quote, to a distinct recognizable group, perhaps a minority, what, if any, is the writer's responsibility toward representing the other accurately? Are there comparable challenges for an author writing from a marginalized position? Our format for every panel is the same. I'll introduce the writers going down the list. They'll each give a brief presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Ida will be wandering around with the microphone, and please don't begin uh, answering your question or asking your question until she reaches you with that microphone, because we want to be sure that the audience watching on YouTube can hear you. Immediately to my left is Azur Nunari, novelist and translator who holds the position of assistant professor in English literature at a government college in Sindh, Pakistan, and is concurrently pursuing a PhD degree from the University of Sindh, Jamshoro. He made his debut in 2016 with the publication of his novel, Black Bird in White Cage, which garnered favorable reviews in newspapers such as the Pakistan Times and Daily Kawish. In 2019, his Sindhi language short story, The Stranger, won the Nassim Qadri Short Story Prize Award, and his story, The Black Hole, was a runner-up for the same prize in 2022. In 2023, Nunari will publish his next novel, A Brief History of Beauty, which is a partial retelling of Homer's Iliad infused with Indian and Arab history and mythology. He has translated more than 30 short stories by esteemed Sindhi writers into English, and his translations into Sindhi of stories by Franz Kafka and Jorge Luis Borges have been published in Sindh's leading literary publications. His participation in the fall residency was made possible by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Next, Lee Katomi is a novelist and translator who is originally from Taiwan and now lives and works in Japan. Her typical process is to write her novels in Japanese and then translate them into Mandarin herself. She is the author of novels whose titles are translated as Solo Dance, The Night of the Shining North Star, and The Island Where Red Spider Lilies Bloom. These works have won the Gunzo New Writers Award for Excellence, the Minister of Education's Art Encouragement Prize for New Artists, and the Octagua Prize, respectively. And this year, The Island Where Red Spider Lilies Bloom was published in Italian. Recurring themes in her work include multilingualism, multiculturalism, identity, and LGBTQ plus experiences. Her participation in the fall residency was made possible by a grant from Taiwan's Ministry of Culture. And I want to add that she has made available copies of her book, uh, Night of the Shining North Store, over there for free. Please pick one up after the reading. And Miharu uh, Yano will read uh, Lee's presentation. Finally, Marina Porcelli is a fiction writer and essayist from Argentina. Her recent work includes the novella Winter Notebook, a collection of essays on gender titled Nausicaia, Journey to the Other Side of Otherness, the short story collection The Hunt, and Of the Broken Night. A frequent contributor to Latin American newspapers, she writes a column called Lyrical Knockout for Playboy Mexico, 
where she explores gender and boxing. Other fiction and essays have appeared in media and anthologies in Argentina, as well as in Chile, Cuba, Mexico, Nicaragua, and China. Her work has garnered the Edmundo Valdez Ibero American Award in Mexico and the Eduardo Malia National Essay Award in Argentina, and she has attended residencies in Mexico, Canada, and China. She has taught creative writing workshops at the Observatory of Violence Against Women in Salta, Argentina, and her hybrid fiction performances piece, Lady Macbeth at Six in the Morning, will receive its world premiere in Buenos Aires this December. Please join me in welcoming our writers. Hello, everyone. I'm Azar Nuri from Pakistan, and I read my paper. <clears throat> and cried, now mark, how do I, uh, how I do rip me, Lo. How is Muhammad mangled before me? Wax Ali weeping from the chin, his face clave to the fallen, from Inferno Dante. You have the bangles of Jagu, yes, a dozen of red and blue glass trend to Pakistan, Kushman Singh. Jagu Singh's searching hand found one end of the cord of her trousers. He pulled it with a jerk, trend to Pakistan. It was already there, the concept of an imposter, a liar, schismatic, and it was regulated and circulated through medieval institutions, statements, and texts. Yes, what Dante says is unthinkable, unimaginable, and unsavory for a Muslim. He received it. What was outside, in the discourse, in the concepts, he followed the correct ways of thinking, strictly adhering to the culturally constructed notions of true and false, good and bad, correct and incorrect. This was the way of thinking, perhaps the correct way of thinking, a European writing for Europeans, selling the convictions and beliefs, unfiltered, exactly the same way as they were outside what preceded the inferno. Wearing bangles in the Indian subcontinent is associated with women, and there is a very popular phrase, go wear bangles and sit at home, a misogynist epithet. Relegating someone to the status of women and associating them with staying at, staying at home, confining them to a fixed position. In Pakistan, women political leaders once hung a bag of bangles on the door of their male political opponents. Speaking in what Derrida would have called the language of the master, this location, persists and circulates in acts, deeds, and concepts everywhere. Tend to, tend to Pakistan, gave it a literary prestige, and as if saying, uh, as, uh, as if the saying had a basis in an ethical position. In an otherwise biological act, positions have been assigned in the language of Foucault, the subject and the object. The subject performs the action, and the object is the recipient of the action. I don't know how it is in the West, but in the Indian subcontinent, symbolism intervenes, extending the signification, giving the privileged position to the subject while ridiculing the object, relegating it to a lower status, debasing and humiliating it. There are two binaries, equal in the natural act, but unequal in the cultural sense, one privileged and other unprivileged, one elevated in the status, victorious, and the other beneath, defeated, perpetually passive within the realm of symbolism. Noura, a Muslim girl and Jagu, a Sikh, asserts his Sikh masculinity over Muslim, symbolizing victory and dominance, as if saying, we have done it with you, your girl, your honor. This war this starts of war, reminiscent of Glassford's aphorism. War is the continuation of policy with other means, a literary war in any unliterary way. In the movie Ghadar, an Indian Sikh man enters Pakistan and takes away a Muslim girl. Then there is a reply in Therapy Army, a Pakistani movie where a Muslim man enters India and brings a Hindu girl to Pakistan, responding in kind, a girl for a girl, contributing to the circulating symbolism that already exists in the discourse. Language carries with itself, within itself a lot of racism, sometimes so subtly hidden and concealed that it escapes common observation. Sexism, ageism, classism, ethnocentrism, heteronormative, uh, heteronormativity, religious bias, relig regional biases, and much more. Lacan says, man is born prematurely. When humans grow, much damage has already been done. Things have been set and fixed with established correct ways of notions of correct ways and notions of normal and abnormal. All comes with language. 
our understanding of the world is profoundly shaped by language and interpretation. To me, a writer is not merely an observer or a sincere reporter who documents everything as it appears, but rather a writer is an intellectual and philosopher. Hence, a writer's primary responsibility lies with language. It must be purified, scrutinized, selected, and corrected before it is granted literary prestige. A writer is a creator. Someone who constructs, makes choices from a vast area of possibilities, measures, and adjusts. There are many ways, numerous alternative paths, and inexhaustible possibilities. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Li Kodomi. Um, I'm from Japan and Taiwan. Usually, I have a more beautiful voice. But I caught a cold last week, um, so um, just my voice just sounds like a duck, and I don't want to torture you with this duck voice. So I will ask Yano Miharu, my translator, to read the text for me. Um, please, Yano Miharu. As a queer creator, I am constantly forced to ask myself, what does it mean to write about the other? Writing about the queer experience in Japan is not easy, because Japan is still a country defined by the values of patriarchy, male superiority, heteronormativity, and cisgender norms. The average annual income of women in Japan is 60 to 70% to that of men, and the percentage of women in the diet is only 10%. The LGBTQ plus community also experiences severe discrimination. In the literary world, cisgender heterosexual men are still often in power. In such an environment, it is very difficult for women and queer writers to be legitimately recognized. I myself am a, a woman, a foreigner in Japan, and a lesbian, which is a very marginal position from which to write fiction. Since I have been writing stories about queer people since my debut novel, I've, I have had my fair share of ignorant reviews by cishet male critics. I would be lying if I said that LGBTQ stories aren't being told in Japan. Especially in recent years, we are seeing more and more LGBTQ plus characters, not only in novels, but also in popular culture such as anime, manga, movies, and TV shows. From my perspective, however, there are few realistic portrayals of the queer experience written in Japan. The reason is that when LGBTQ characters or narratives are included, they are often produced or written by cisgender and heterosexual creators. And rather than depicting the raw reality of queer people like their difficulties in life and the political realities that affect them, these creators merely view queerness as things to be consumed to make their creation stand out or interesting. In other words, they are depicting their stories from the outside, not from the inside. As a queer person, I have made a great effort to portray the queer community from the inside. In my novel, The Night of the Shining North Star, I depict interactions between queer women from various backgrounds in Shinjuku Nichome, the largest gay district in Asia. Though this should be obvious, it is often forgotten that the queer community is made up of individuals possessing different ways of thinking, different values, of different generations, and differing experiences. There is joy sadness, despair, and struggle. There are individuals without power, but there is a community that supports these individuals. There is discrimination and conflict even within the queer community, and this exists alongside a history of solidarity and struggle against the majority society. Why is it important to write this kind of work? It is because in Japanese society, where cisgender and heterosexual people are the absolute majority, LGBTQ plus people are more often than not lumped together and put aside as other. They often say, yeah, I know, LGBT means sexual minorities, right? And presume they get it and appear smarter just by adding the term LGBTQ plus to their vocabulary. But such an attitude is not literary. It is simply intellectual colonialism. To resist intellectual colonization by the majority, I needed to write well-written, convincing queer stories at a higher resolution. To write high-resolution queer narratives, I needed to write from within the queer community. I am not saying that if you are not a queer person, you should not write queer stories. If we could only write characters that overlap with our identities or communities, it would, only be, it would not only be narrow-minded gatekeeping, but it would also be contrary to the true nature of literature. 
After all, writing a novel or story is ultimately about portraying others. Without portraying others, one cannot write a story. However, as a queer creator, I can't help but think about the long history of mainstream literature and media depicting our community as a disease, as perverts, as deranged serial killers, or even as objects of pity. These representations of minorities that reproduce the prejudices held by the majority not only appropriate the minority experience, but are detrimental to our community. Here in Iowa, we gather every week to talk about the greatness of literature and poetry. However, I must point out that for marginalized groups, TV shows, films, and even novels and poetry have the power to harm and hurt. Fortunately, there seems to be a growing number of films in the US in recent years that tell queer stories in high resolution from inside the queer community. What these films have in common is that the actors or directors themselves are queer. Again, I am not saying that if you're not a queer person, you should not write queer stories. In writing a literary work, it is inevitable that you will portray the experiences of others. The question is how to portray them. I think the bare minimum is to not reinforce prejudices and stereotypes of the dominant society in the world of the work. This is not an unreasonable demand. After all, all of us writers carefully observe the world, digest it in our own way, and incorporate it into our work. We just want them to do the same when depicting marginalized people, such as the queer community. Our presentations that only reproduce prejudices and stereotypes reveal nothing but the laziness of the creator. At the same time, it is important to cultivate a diverse group of writers. To a greater or lesser extent, a writer's expression is influenced by his or her experience and background. Therefore, the more writers from diverse backgrounds there are, the more fertile the world of literature will become. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, I'm very glad because I'm here, I'm a bit nervous. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Maricela, Wesley, Sunest, and Arthur, because we have been talking about having these discussions about these topics. So uh, special thanks for them. Well, Virginia Woolf, uh, I start. Virginia Woolf published her first novel, The Voyage Out in 1915. That what stands out in her book is the part of the story takes place in Brazil, and absurdly, Wolf locates Brazil in Argentina. I am bringing this to your attention because I first want to talk about what Mary Luce Pratt calls imperialized or the imperial gaze, the dynamic that puts the eyes, the gaze of the colonizer, into una determinada position. In fact, an early example of this can be found in the journal of Cristóforo Columbus. It is enough to read these entries to understand how Columbus names, conceives, and conquers the land in ways illustrative of his concept. How his molding of others through his gaze did lasting damage to the people of the so-called New World. The imperial gaze necessarily results in distortions not only geographical. What does it mean to be the other? What, in general sense, is called the otherness dimension? The philosopher and anthropologist Franz, Amnon, Franz Fanon states that the human parad paradigm has been formulated on the basis of the image of the Western white man. This entails that the others are all those not included in that representations. Women, migrants, indigenous communities, and a very long etc. There are a lot of communities that I have to mention here, of course. Those of us who were constructed by the wars and the aids of the masters. Those who have the story that was created under the gaze of this master. There is a paradox in Latin America. The struggle for independence from Spain that took place all over the continent at the beginning of the 19th century did not lead to linguistic independence. Around 1810, the vast territory was linguistically homogenizado, with the Spanish language being imposed all the way from the Rio Bravo along the border between Mexico and the United States to the southmost tip of Patagonia. This Spanish that was imposed on the different regions 
came to be modified, molded, rearranged, altered by the art and language that had already existed in these places. The Spanish that emerged was an hybrid with traces of Arabic, languages of indigenous people, etc., giving it linguistic variety, robbing it of its colonial purity. Spain then sees our, sees our pronunciation, our way of speaking, as incorrect Spanish. It is very interesting to also observe the moral sense this incorrect Spanish has. It's an ethical burden. The different pronunciations across Latin America speak of different historical processes of domination that lie in the speech. This may sound obvious, but I still want to say it. Our, every pronunciation, is a political issue. To speak wrongly is a way of bringing the, log the logic of language, which is also a way of dismantling the logic, or lack therefore, of the system in which we were immersed a form of psychic decolonization. I remember that when I attended elementary school, the Spanish I was taught, the correct Spanish, was different from the language spoken at my home or in the streets. Tenses were changed, for example. And this is very important because by then, the wrong Spanish was speech, our orality. And the right Spanish was the official language the writing language, the one to be taken seriously. And I believe one of the most important aspects writing in Latin America has is precisely this, to include orality within prose. This idea is also in an extraordinary essay by the Cuban writer Fernández Retamar, published in La Habana in 1972, Caliban. Caliban, as you may know, is a character from Shakespeare's Thames, who is the first inhabitant of the desert island and wild and brutal man in the eyes of the white man Prospero. In Shakespeare's play, Caliban provides the material conditions so that his conquerors can live comfortably. In many ways, Caliban symbolizes the Latin American situation. In Caliban, the guise of the invader is condensed, and at the same time, Caliban synthesizes one of the strongest maths of la invasión, el lenguaje. Fernández Retamar quotes Shakespeare. You have taught me to speak, and the benefit that it had brought me is to know how to curse. May the red flag fall on you for having still me in me your language. Bad pronunciación, Oral orality, a grammatical use of language, cursing. These are some of the possibilities for writing in America Latina because that Spanish does not represent us. We have to constantly modify it, break it, take it to the limit where our rea realities can appear. As such, I will always distrust, distrust well writing books that gracefully appropriated the language of the colonizador. Those books that are easy to translate. It is also worth noting that it is the editorial market that establishes the rules of how the Spanish language production is supposed to be, regulating books that should circulate, con circulate on the continent and those that should not, books that should be visible and those commended to obscurity. What topics become fashionable? Which stories and which point of view on those stories are taken up and which are left aside. Ultimately, the point of debate is, what are the images of America Latina in literary represent representations? My point is that we have a huge responsibility as writers. We must respond to the stereotypes and account of our stories in our territories with our identities. Our writing is not for pleasing the colonized eyes, el ojo del colonizador. The rate of illiteracy, semi-illiteracy, and percent of our populations to do not, that do not have access to books are alarming in America Latina. The editorial system keeps the things as they are. So immersed as we are in these conditions, we have to wonder, who are we writing for? And maybe, or more than maybe, we have to create another way of being writers. Thank you. <laughs>
to your questions, and while you are formulating your questions, let me first uh, thank the Iowa City Public Library, which makes this space available to us every Friday, uh, as well as the Dean of International Programs, Russ Ganim, who makes possible the pizza we have at the back. For those of you watching at home, it's really good. <laughs> and finally, just a reminder that next week, these presentations, these pracy, will be available online at iwp.uiowa.edu. Join us later today at 5 o'clock for the next event in our weekly Shambaugh House reading series featuring Ali al-Shali, who is from the United Arab Emirates, and Mansoura Ez al Din, who is from Egypt. This Sunday, October 14th at 4 p.m., our Prairie Lights reading series will feature Yashika Graham from Jamaica, our own Lee Katomi from Taiwan and Japan, and MFA and playwriting candidate Derek Edgren Otero. We hope to see you there. Afterward, on that same Sunday at 7 o'clock in room 105 of the Adler Journalism Building, our Cinema Tech series will screen the short film We Are Dying Here, introduced by Busiswi Malango, and the feature-length documentary film Stream of Life, introduced by Rita Pekan Pekanen. The films will be followed by a brief Q&A. Finally, please join us again here next Friday, October 6th at noon, for another discussion panel featuring uh, Yasiro Yosumoto, Sunist Nathaniel Shia Fang, and Anna John Scott, who will discuss the theme of style in the hard light of algorithm. A reminder that to, when, to ask your questions, please wait for Ida to bring you the microphone. And who would like to begin? This is that pregnant silence. Uh, right there. Hi. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. It was very, very insightful. Um, I have a question for the three of you. I was traveling through some of the post-Soviet Union states like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Georgia, and I noticed that there was this movement to go back to languages before Russian. So in Kazakhstan, Kazakh, in Uzbek, Uzbekistan, Uzbek, and in Georgia, they, they were, there were some statues uh, commemorating poets, mainly poets. So I was wondering, especially Marina, your essay was beautiful. In Latin America, we haven't had this movement to, to learn, I don't know, Mapuche or, or uh, Nahuatl. I mean, it's there, but it's, it's not as strong. Uh, so that was just an example. But I was wondering, since we are talking about um, colonizing languages, why some parts of the world have tried to, to recover languages before colonization more than others? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me? I start? I start? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Hello, how are you? Um, there's, uh, I can talk about only about Argentina, South America, no more. I don't want to be generally speaking and all that. But uh, there's a very important thing that is happening with our Spanish, that we have a lot of indigenous words. For example, Che, you may probably you all know Che Guevara. Che means people in Mapuche. It's an indigenous language for the Patagonia. But the, the horrible, the interesting thing is that no one knows that it's an indigenous language. I mean, we are speaking in the indigenous, with in the indigenous terms and lexicals, but the people doesn't know. That the people don't know, sorry. <laughs> but my point is that uh, Argentina has a campaign of invisibilization of these kind of languages. So if you are interested, you can go to the university and you can learn it. And if you are more interested, you can walk around Buenos Aires and you can hear the languages. But the official, I mean, the official, the official politics said, oh, no, no, we are not talking that kind of languages. A very beautiful example of this is Paraguay. Paraguay, 90% of the people are speaking in Guarani. I mean, Spanish is the second language, in fact. So uh, I think it's a struggle, a political struggle, 
uh, between the presence of the people speaking those languages and what the, of the official politics are saying, something like that. Mexico has uh, very strong examples too. May I answer, did I answer the question? So, so? <laughs> Chris, can you get a chair for Yano? Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll get you to her, but uh, Azur, would you like to take the question on? No. Azur? No, no, this question is not connected with this question. No? Okay. Important to remember we're here in Iowa, and we don't actually know the derivation of the word Iowa. We know it's from an indigenous language. Arab speakers know it as the word that means yes, but it's a, clearly a part of a heritage that has disappeared from, from view. Uh, did, did you want to answer, Lee? Okay, then we'll open it up to other, other questions. Yeah. It's just really a comment from Marina. You know, I lived in Spain for four years and learned Spanish there, the real Spanish. I'm being very sarcastic. Um, and the Spanish people that I met think that the Argentinians speak the best Spanish of Latin America. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. It's just a comment. Because I have the RAE, I mean, the, the rules from Spain, talking, telling me all the time what I have to, to write in magazines, in publishers, in, on TV. I mean, we're all having that rules that you have to follow the, the good Spanish, I mean, the official Spanish. So when this, uh, uh, for example, this, this, uh, this thing that's happening with translations, that they, there are some writers saying, oh, I will write an easy book so they can translate it. This neutral Spanish to be translated. So uh, that's for me like the means to delay your own identity and, and history. Uh, so no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, we have a very, a very, it's a huge difference between that, the bad, that Spanish and our Spanish. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, Lee Katomi, in your essay, you spoke about the diversity of the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. and representing that. How do you handle the diversity of the people within it that don't um, have your same backgrounds, mm -hmm. whether racially or a transgender character or an intersex character or a mix of people and, and mm -hmm. attributes within their diversity? Um, so Leah has said that she has many friends who have very different backgrounds and within the LGBTQ community and through interacting them with on, a, on a personal level as well as looking through resources and um, texts, um, she dives headfirst deep into their experiences as much as possible in order to write their experience as clearly and as fully as possible. The LGBTQ community sticks together for the most part in Japan. Mm -hmm. So when I interact with these people, even within the same group, I try to um, be aware of the differences that I have um, in relation to them and to, to write them within my um, fiction. I said, could I ask you to comment on the, you choose to write in Cindy, uh, and we also, in America, we have, a, if, we under, if we know much about Pakistani literature, it comes from the English language writers. Could you talk about the difference between those writing in Urdu, in Cindy, in other so-called smaller languages, and that their relationship to the, to the English-speaking writers? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is, uh, there is a lot more literature produced in Sindhi as well, a uh, lot more progressive literature mostly, and romantic as well, and somehow uh, realist as well. But the thing is, uh, when we write in Sindhi, uh, we have a very, a very short community, or maybe just it, it goes into, uh, into the Sindh, of course. 
and it doesn't go to uh, Punjab, it doesn't go to KPK in other areas because uh, those people uh, speak and read in other language. So again, the thing is, if we, if we are writing in Sindhi, again, we have to translate it and make it in Urdu and uh, or maybe English to, to circulate the work in books in entire Pakistan. But when it comes to Pakistani English writers, uh, they have, uh, I personally believe they have very Western point of view when they are writing. I would name some like uh, Mohsen Hamid and Nadeem Aslam and Kamila Shamsi. They are actually not writing Pakistani stories. Uh, even uh, Mohammed Hanif, they are I don't know how, uh, maybe sometimes very arbitrary, they are connecting the West with the Pakistan, like since this extremism and these things and the, uh, these things. So I, I give you an example, and that uh, moment Danish now is red birds, and red birds, and somewhere around the Arabic region and somewhere around Pakistan subcontinent, an American pilot crashes and comes down, and then he's stuck in desert Elvery. I was saying, uh, are, there, uh, are there not uh, pilots in Pakistan? There are a lot many pilots in Pakistan or they are in Hindustan. Why American pilots come and the crashes over there? Though the story is entirely about East, about Pakistan and this Arabic region. The thing is they are arbitrarily connecting the West with, with uh, Pakistan and with this extremism and these things. Uh, still, I have read very few Pakistani novels in English that are purely Pakistani stories, are the stories of the East. Even if there are uh, stories, like uh, uh, there is Bright novel by, by uh, and a Pakistani writer, I, I miss her name. The uh, novel's name is Bright, Pakistani Bright. Okay. I mean, even then, Bright, uh, that uh, darker side of Pakistan is being put out, maybe as if giving the world a look at how, how dark is the Pakistan about women, about minorities, and they're there. Okay, there are a lot, maybe not good things in Pakistan, but there are a lot, uh, sorry, uh, good things as well in Pakistan. Some cheerful things, some lively things. But I hardly see when it is English writers, I hardly see some cheerful, lively, like a love in the time of Kalra. I never read such things in uh, Pakistani. Museum of Innocence, uh, Oran Palmox, no such romantic good novels that actually celebrate the life, that uh, they look at the life in a cheerful way. Just they bring out uh, Pakistani problems, and that's sort of more political, and they bring out through the literature. Yeah. I had a feeling you might have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is for Lika Tami. Uh, this is me, it's Natasha, hi. So um, you are in the interesting position of writing across two languages and two cultures um, and self-translate, if that's how, it, how you want to call it. Uh, so in effect, you're always writing another. Can you talk a little bit about that split across the Sea of Japan and why you, how, how that shapes your writing? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> so how does writing both in Taiwan and in Japan now more and more as a Japanese, from a Japanese perspective with Japanese as the first language, but then also translating yourself back into Chinese and into therefore the Taiwanese context. How does that split between those two languages and those two cultures um, feature, how does, it, how does it work in your head? There. <laughs> um, a long time ago, I used to write uh, novels in Chinese. And I always believe that writing in a second language would be impossible. When I moved to Japan, however, I was suddenly filled with this urge to write in Japanese. And when I did it, it, it turned out 
great that I could actually do it. And it was a huge surprise and a learning experience for me. But by that time, I'd lived in Japan and been conversing and interacting with Japanese people on a daily basis. So for me to write in Japanese had become a natural thing for me. Um, um, and by then I had been taking classes in Japanese, writing my uh, graduate thesis in Japanese. I had been dreaming in Japanese, so Japanese had become my language. And when I Right when I used to write it, uh, when I wrote in Japanese, my head was entirely in Japanese. There was I was not a uh, retrans or back translating into Japanese in my own head from China, from Taiwanese. And when I retranslate my own work, I interpret it as somebody else's work, not my own work. And so when I'm reading my work in Japanese and translating it back into Taiwanese, it is the process is as if I'm uh, translating somebody that I don't know. <laughs> the biggest difference is that because it's my work, I know what the author is trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for your interesting essays. Um, I was wondering, on the topic of this conversation, uh, I grew up partially in the UK, uh, where the debate on appropriation, for better or worse, does not seem to be as prominent. And I was wondering if in the context in which you write, whether appropriation is something that's often talked about, um, and if so, whether that debate seems to take a different form in different contexts. Who would like to take that on? So I couldn't, uh, can you repeat your question a bit slowly? Yes. Um, where, in the places where you're, sometimes a, the focus on appropriation seems to me to be particularly American. And I am wondering whether in the places in which you are writing, whether people often discuss appropriation or whether you should be writing characters who are different from your own background? Yeah. Of course, uh, I believe, uh, first, uh, first thing, that, that in every culture, uh, in every region, sorry, not the culture, even in culture or in the region, there are always lines. And people expect that these lines are respected. When I am a Sindhi writer, I'm writing uh, maybe a character is Punjabi. Okay. Now Punjabis would be expecting me that when you represent us, you write us, write us as we are, not the way you think about us. So this is why I always believe that these lines, though sometimes they are blurry, they are thin, and sometimes they are overlapping, but we know where are the lines, and we must be respecting those lines. This is what I believe. Uh, I want to say, I don't know if I understand your question properly, but uh, I want to say that for me it's very important not to take the voice of the others, I mean not to replace, not to, to say that you are a person or, or someone that you are not. So to shape a character for me is like an ethical burden. It's not uh, a very easy thing that you can say, oh, that's the, that's the character and that's all. I mean, you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper in their cultural sense, historical process. So that's our, those are maybe the, the keys that I am thinking about when I think about characters. But this is not to replace the voice of the others. For me, is a central political uh, meaning, something like that. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I Azhar. Okay. Um, Pakistan, when it was created, you know, less than 4% of Pakistani people spoke Urdu. You know, it was mostly vernacular language like Sindhi, Pakhtun, um, Punjabi, and Bengali. Uh, Bengali sep uh, separated in 1971, so it became Bangladesh. So, because Pakistan was created in a particular ideology, a religious ideology, how did it, because uh, Urdu was predominantly spoken in uh, India, Lucknow, in UP and uh, Northern India. So how did imposition of Urdu as the national language in Pakistan impact the vernacular language like your own language, your mother tongue, Sindhi and Punjabi and uh, you know, even Pakhtun? Uh, so how did it affect and how, is it still affecting the growth of uh, many literature that happened in these regional languages in Pakistan? Okay. <clears throat> the thing is, first, uh, what is the general um, idea about Urdu language in, of course, Sindh and uh, sometimes Pakistan, that Urdu is the language of warriors, Lashkari Ziban. In Sindhi, we say Lashkari Ziban. This is the language of warriors. Of course, this is a fact that uh, most people have their uh, native languages, Sindhi, Punjabi, and everything. But what actually happened, uh, people came, migrated, uh, maybe half a million or a million people migrated from uh, Hindustan to Pakistan when Pakistan was created. Now, they claimed actually, which was not true historically and politically as well, they claimed that it is we people who have won you the freedom. We were fought, fighting for you people. And since you were not fighting, in Punjab you were not doing, we were fighting for your freedom in Hindustan, maybe in Delhi, everywhere. And it was the language of that small group actually. But when they came to Pakistan, because they were politically active, and some of them were leaders, okay, and their claim actualized also, somehow maybe. But there were political movements, and the Sindh and Punjab as well, and Sindh was hub of their political movements against this colonialism. So that small group took the bigger positions, because they were at the centers. We were not at the centers. Sindh was at the margin, and Balochistan was at the margin. So, Mahmoud Ali Jinnah and these other leaders, they were speaking Urdu. And they came into Pakistan and they, by policy, by laws, everything, they just, just introduced Urdu everywhere, everywhere, and it still goes on. But now, people in Pakistan have accepted the Urdu as a common language. We communicate with each other because Sindhi is a regional language, Punjabi is regional. But yet, Pakistan people have now accepted that Urdu is a common language they can, uh, we can use, communicate or with each other. Nice. Yesterday on, uh, on the bus back from Chicago, me and Iktaria, John, we discussed this uh, very big subject, actually, because writing the others could say, we could say writing on behalf of animals, on behalf of <laughs> wolves, on, and it, co it could go to limits that we cannot even describe. But my question is very simple. As writers, do you see your fiction greater project as personal, so you will keep writing for your from your mar marginalized position, or you can take somebody else's marginalized position as writing and reading is merely, to me, an empathy, an exercise of empathy and somewhat sympathy. Could you talk about somebody else's problems in one of your fiction works? It's a question for the three of you. Can I take it? So uh, when it, uh, if you have particular mentions novel, so to me, first of all, novel is an uh, object of form. I don't believe that this is a subject of form like romantic poetry, maybe. For, to me, and the tradition of novel goes back to the storytelling. I believe, personally, that to me, novel is a form of storytelling, not telling the perspectives, take on how I take the waste, how I see the uh, Arab world, how I see the Indian snow. This is something, serious debate, must be done very clearly in, through non-fiction works. I say each genre has its objectives. And the object of novel is not to initiate some of these serious religious things and these things through the correct snow. The first objective of novel is to tell a story. 
a good story novel is for story telling but i don't know how people are going for it creating some characters and through characters they are telling the world about their own ideology and their agendas and like these like these things so a novel has become instrumental actually an instrument and i don't see novel should be an instrument novel should be only a novel to me and it it must be with objective form and it the primary object of novel should be storytelling um I think uh, I will take the question uh, talking about the characters. Uh, for me, it's a very ethical burden. It's a very important uh, situation. And one of the solution, I mean, when you when you think about a character, you have to think about the subject, not the object. Because being an object, like being flat, as all the public or the audience or Spain or someone is expecting, for me, is like a, a, a problem. So I was thinking about building characters, but not only one, maybe two. So you can go deeper with their uh, characteristics. I mean, it's not only to, to build a character uh, from the Martian as you are expecting to, or maybe you can build a lot of characters in your novel with a lot of characteristics and make them human, or humanizarlos. That's my position. And I think and about the audience and the public, I, I, I write to my public and my people. And after that, then universalizar the universal lizard, the, the books, not in the other's uh, way. Sorry. <laughs> Did you want to add anything, Lee? Um, so my, my question might be kind of similar to uh, the previous as well, but um, a few years ago I was reading, um, Tom Wolfe had a book called I Am Charlotte Simmons, and there was a minor character who was, trying, who was a rapper, and the way that he wrote this, uh, this hip-hop lyric was just so, so laughable. <laughs> that, um, so do you have um, something that you do like by immersion, so even if it's a secondary character or someone who's minor, but how to have a modicum of authenticity within that so it doesn't come off as, as laughable? So even if you're not trying to completely like speak through the perspective of this um, character that you have, you know, some some measure, some almost like method writing thing that you have an immersion into that perspective, if that you know, makes sense. You take you. No. Actually, I'm sorry, I couldn't follow your question because I see the voice from here is failed. So can you briefly, just briefly one line repeat so and then can I can say yes, please. Yeah. So um, if you have a character, even if it's a minor character and you're trying to um, voice it with authenticity, do you have an immersion process? You know how people sometimes will method act. Do you have a method writing uh, way to immerse yourself into that character's identity where you can maybe write it with um, some more authentic authenticity? I, I don't know if that made it any clearer. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, th this, uh, this, this notion of authenticity is very difficult. I said, we create. Uh, uh, my theory of a uh, novel is not that uh, Aristotelian imitation. I don't believe that novel is the imitation of what you have everything seen around. Novel is a creation. We construct society. We construct a world. We construct something, made, build it. So. I, I feel it is quite unnecessary to going on about these things, that this character must be authentic with his race and the, 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 that thing. I'll give you an example from this novel, uh, Train to Pakistan. And Noura is a Muslim girl, and it was maybe, may not be the intention of question Singh, but the interpretations are many. Okay, now even Noura, Noura character is so minor, just it is being used as an object of sex for Jagu Singh. If you even remove out the pages of that Noura and give somebody a novel, nobody knows that they are the page, pages have been turned off, actually. It was so minor character, but the significance is very high. Significance of that character is, is very high, uh, particularly in the context of a Muslim girl. Now, what uh, in the same novel there is another uh, thing that uh, Nuran's father is an uh, Imam who hears the prayer. He is 60 year. He is blind, and we find the novel he is very cold. What can one expect from 60 year old blind man? Of course, he can't go the fight for freedom or anything. Of course, he can't can't go for it. So the thing is, we can do with these minor characters without going into this race and these things that just for the sake of authenticity. We are not, our objective of the novel is not to be authentic. The object of novel is to tell the story. Authenticity cannot be decided anywhere. 
We can never. There is no original central point of authenticity. Yeah, this is the thing, and we can't put the finger over this is the thing. Of course not. There is not, authenticity is non-originary. It is non, it is non-originary, okay? So, we can't place the hand, oh, this is the thing. Of course, my friend thinks in another way, I think in another way, okay? And there's no center, Deridian center. There is no center that we can say this, okay, that's my thing. Uh, I just want to say that, yes, for me, writing is not a copy. I mean, it's not a mirror of reality. It's a, a representation or a taken position to, about from that reality. I mean, so we re recreate the characters because of the story or because of your, yeah, that's what I see. Okay, I will answer Ali and Monica's question uh, together. Um, I think it is impossible to not write the other in, in a fictional work, other from my perspective. As Ali mentioned, writing about an animal is also writing about the other. And I believe that it is possible to write the other, to write the other minority positions that I don't exist in. But to write it is an adventure, to journey, it's a risk. And there are opportunities where um, one fails in writing the other. And that it is entirely possible to perpetuate stereotypes and prejudices unknowingly. Um, but if we were to not write the other um, due to the risk of misrepresenting the other, then we would all be writing the same novels with the same main characters. Um, and it would only uh, homogenize uh, the novels and the literature that comes out of um, everywhere. For example, in convenience stores in Japan, there are a lot of uh, foreign workers, but when they appear in literature in Japanese, they are often, the workers within the fictional convenience stores are um, run by Japanese people, and the reality of these uh, worker situations are lost within Japanese literature. Um, and this is probably because Japanese writers are afraid of writing the other, of, afraid of writing what they don't understand, the foreign. And so they are uh, reduced to something that doesn't exist. <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. But I believe that it is very important to write these realities in the in the most high resolution way that I can, and that it is our responsibility as writers to do so. Lit literature is not just a uh, a reflection or a mimicry of reality. But literature that reproduces the majority ideas and prejudices cannot be called literature. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid, uh, okay, we'll make one very quick last question.
Thank you. Okay, I'll make it quick, maybe. Um, <laughs> this is in response to something Marina said in her, um, in her pressy. It was, our writing is not for pleasing the colonizer's eye. I have a sort of general question for each of you about the role of pleasure. You're going to your... have to make it quick because we have one minute. So okay, basically, it... my question is, what do you do when you feel, you know, if your writing is not for pleasing the colonizer's eye, what do you do or how do you feel when perhaps the colonizer's eye or a perceived majority uh, appreciates your work or identifies with it in some way? Does that question make sense? So, you know, uh, like what of... It's a kind of quote. It's a very famous quote for a, a, a North African poet. And I have read it a long time ago. Uh, it's, uh, we have to okay, make our balance. I mean, because uh, you have to take your position. What are you interested in? I mean, who is going to say that your work is good? What it means, I don't believe in the sellers. I don't, don't believe in this kind of what are the bookstores selling to, uh, to saying that they are good books. So uh, you have to take your position. That's my position. <laughs> that means you have to re redefinir, re rethink what it means to be a writer, for example, in America Latina, where the most of the people don't accept to work. So what, do, what, what are we talking about? Who are we writing for? So for me, I mean, I, I am thinking about a lot of strategies, a lot of ways of this is good, this is what I want, this is what I can be useful. I mean, it's not, I am not going to heredar, her, heritage, I am not going to copy the way of being a writer. That's not, use, that's not a good thing for me, it's not useful for my people or for my country. So I think uh, you have to decide. Uh, that's what, who are you going to please if you want to please? Because I don't think the writing is for pleasing uh, the opposite. I think that the writing is for another things. May I, did I? And um, that's going to have to be the last word because we've come to the end. Thank you so very much for this fabulous presentation.